Hello, I'm Melissa Nahn, President and CEO of the American Composers Orchestra, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Professional Development Webinar Series, co-presented by the American Composers Orchestra and the American Composers Forum. I'm really excited for today's panel. We have a roundtable with conductors Man Chen and David Allen Miller, moderated by ACO's very own Artistic Director, Derek Burmell. Couple of little technical reminders today, please do feel free to use the Q&A button located right below your video to submit your questions to the panelists. We'll have some time to answer those within the last 15 minutes of the webinar. And also please feel free to use the chat function to say hello, to interact with your fellow attendees and let us know where you're coming from. It'll be a great space for us to get to know each other. This panel will be recorded and available on ACO's YouTube and ACF's website. And I'd also like to thank those who made this webinar series possible, the Virginia B. Tolman Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and individual donors. And last but not least, a huge thank you goes out to ACF staff, Billy Lackey, Laura Kreider, Damian Strange, and Vanessa Rose, and ACO staff, Jade Jong, Aiden Feltkamp, Lindsay Working, and Derek Burmell. And speaking of which, Derek Burmell. when he comes on camera. Oh, you did it. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. And um, welcome to our guests today, uh, Man Chen and David Allen Miller. Um, it's, it's really great to have you both with us. And um, I'm very excited for this talk because uh, it's rare that, uh, that, that, you know, composers get a chance to hear straight from the source of the conductors, um, you know, uh, just what's going on in, in those minds of yours. And I think uh, this will be really, really interesting, especially being that you're two great champions of, of music. Uh, I should mention that uh, Man uh, Chen is the, uh, is the conductor and music director of the Chicago Sinfonietta and the artistic director and conductor for the National Taiwan Symphony Orchestra Summer Festival. Um, and so, and David Allen Miller, um, multi-Grammy award-winning uh, conductor and music director of the Albany Symphony. Thank you, welcome to both of you. Great to be with you, Derek and Melissa and Mayen. Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here. It's an amazing reunion of uh, old friends and dear friends and, and meeting new friends. Thank you, Melissa, for your introduction. And Derek, go blue. <laughs> go blue, that's right. Yeah, taking it to, uh, taking it to the, uh, the, the Big Ten. Um, we, yes, we are both graduates of the University of Michigan. So, uh, so nice to be thinking about that. And, um, and by the way, for those of you who are signing in from, uh, from many different places, uh, in, in, in the world, potentially, uh, please let us know where you are, uh, who you are and, um, and please, uh, Make sure to ask questions, you know, put them into the chat and we'll try to get to them uh, as, as the session goes on today. So, uh, so, so please, you know, let us know uh, about, you know, your concerns, things you're thinking about, um, whether you're a composer, conductor, performer, uh, or an audience member uh, who loves what, what these people do. Um, Man, I just wanted to start with you because you've got this, uh, David's got the homey background behind him, but uh, man, you've got this beautiful concert hall. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's quite special. Absolutely, I'm happy to. Um, the concert hall you see behind me is the new concert hall called Wei Wuying in my hometown of Taiwan, Kaohsiung, now has the largest art complex since November of 20, 2018. It used to be an old military base and then now they turned that into four different venues. And I, I'm proud to say it's one of the best uh, concert halls in Asia right now. Uh, Berlin Phil, Vienna Phil have already toured there. And so hopefully one of these days post COVID that, you know, that we can welcome many of you to Taiwan to experience this wonderful vineyard style, but the sound is incredible. Almost every sound gets equal um, sonic experience. So hopefully one of these days, welcome to Taiwan for the dumplings and the concert hall. I saw the, uh, the video that you showed me about that hall and it's just incredible the work that's gone into that. Um, is, was, was, 
new music was contemporary music very much on the minds of of the architects and and all the folks who built it it's just an enormous amount of work that has taken yes and, and i believe there's a recent article on the league uh, news about this venue and um the artistic director um is is an incredible uh, taiwanese conductor who has stay who has given up uh, his position in germany to really envision the new uh, art center for for taiwan and for for kaohsiung and so new music is definitely um very much forefront of his visions um i i, I don't want to you know um break the news for them but i think they're envisioning new music festival coming up to be announced and i did i did the taiwanese premiere of anna klein's masquerade um, in, in my recent um, program there. And so absolutely, I think, I think you will start to notice uh, this new festival taking place in Taiwan in the future. That's great. Actually, Anna Klein is a composer uh, who uh, ACO has, has performed and championed and she was actually uh, one of the, the co-curators for the Sonic Festival several years ago. So that's that's great that you're bringing American music around the world. And uh, as David Allen Miller has done, um, David, you have two uh, extraordinary venues there in Albany, um, one of them being that beautiful Troy, uh, historical uh, Troy Savings Bank Hall. And then you have, uh, for a, on a, a very different way, you have MPAC. Um, can you talk about how those have, um, you know, kind of come into your, your programming plans and uh, how have these halls inspired you in any ways? Yeah, hey Derek. Um, yeah, it is kind of uncanny and, and a little weird in a way in that the, the Troy Music Hall is one of the legendary concert venues in the world and certainly in the country. And in fact, when George Sell used to tour the Cleveland Orchestra of the Northeast, he would insist on their playing a concert in the music hall, even though the stage is really narrow and they would all have to like jam themselves in simply because he wanted the Cleveland Orchestra members to hear the acoustic of the space. So it's, it's been around you know, since the 1870s really. And it has this amazing, if you've never been in the hall, it has this amazing organ loft, which acts as sort of a, uh, an unbelievable megaphone sending the sound out into the hall. It's about an 1200 seat hall, but then remarkably RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the engineering school up on the hill, about six blocks away from there, decided about 10 years ago to build this gorgeous, sounds similar to what Mayan is, is describing, gorgeous arts complex with an, another amazing 1200 seat hall, but super modern, you know, unbelievably uh, worked out and to do sonic experiments as well as concerts. Um, and it's just kind of weird that they put these two concert halls, <laughs> these two ideal concert halls within like six blocks of each other in Troy, New York. So we, we do kind of design programming. You know, we do all of our recording in those two halls and the bigger things we put in, in the, um, MPAC, it's called the MPAC Hall at RPI, and the more traditional things we put in Troy, but, um, and also the bigger things we put in, just the bigger things and also the kind of more ultra modern things because there's so many possibilities at MPAC. Um, but they're both just gorgeous acoustics and really interesting spaces. So we do design a lot of things around them. And at the end of every season, Derek, as you well know, we do a big uh, like week long American music festival and we'll feature like 50 works by 35 composers. And we do that mainly at MPAC at RPI because it's got a lot of other little venues around it, an opera house and two black boxes and things like that. So it's just well, a bounty of riches. It's amazing. Well, you, you've told me that Troy is uh, the Brooklyn of, of upstate New York. I mean, um, Except it's getting more expensive than Brooklyn. That's the only problem. <laughs> I think of Brooklyn as the Troy of much harder to buy of, it. Of New York problem. city. So if you have time, run out and do it this week, come on up. We'd love to have you, everybody. Not yeah. just Derek, but yeah, it's it's really it's it's really certainly pre-pandemic, it was becoming this amazing mecca. And I think now post-pandemic, it will again, you know, the there was a big article in the paper last week about the Hudson Valley, all sorts of people moving up from the city. And you know, we're kind of at the northern end of the Hudson Valley, but I think we're seeing a lot of people coming up here as well. Well, the Albany Symphony has had such an incredible record of championing American music in particular and new music in general, uh, but can you speak to us about, I mean, what, what, when did, when did that start? What, I, I know that you even started before your Albany Symphony days, you were at the New York Youth Symphony, which also has a, a great tradition of performing American work and commissioning American work every year. And um, can you talk about how you got particularly interested in this kind of work and in, in the work of composers of your generation and generations before and after? 
Sure. I don't, want to, I don't want to go into too much detail or I'll, I'll run the clock. I don't want to run the clock, but, but I connected the New York Youth Symphony, right? When I got to Juilliard as a master's student, the second year I was able to become the conductor of the New York Youth Symphony, which was kind of more abundant at the time. And we did a lot of things. I was 20 at the time. And so we did a lot of things to bucket up. And I had this idea that the way to get a critic to show up to all the concerts was to play a new piece of music on each concert and Barry Goldberg, legendary manager who was there for 27 years or so, um, he, he, I had hired him in my second year and he devised this whole series called First Music, where in fact on every single concert we commissioned a young American composer to write an eight minute piece that opened the Carnegie Hall concert. And so I kind of started, I, I'm ashamed to say as a marketing ploy, but it was so wonderful. Not only was it so successful at getting notice, but it was so wonderful for me to meet. I mean, in that first year, it was Aaron Kernis and David Lang. And the second year was Michael Dorkey and you know Michael Doherty and Julia Wolf and everybody uh, got all sorts of really great composers of our generation, even a little earlier, got first music commissions. And I, I began to have so much fun and it was so exciting for me to have living composers to talk to and to work with. And you know, we would rehearse these pieces over 10 weeks every week and with these kids, some of whom were 12 years old. And um, so we really got enmeshed in it. And then I went out to LA to be the assistant and then the associate conductor with the Philharmonic there. And I remember when I got there, John Harbison was out there as composer in residence. And, I was so excited to meet him. And he said, oh yeah, I, I know all about you. I've gotten all these tapes at the time from all the composers who had first music commissions. So I just kind of fell into it. And then I just found that it was the most satisfying work. And so in Albany, you know, really not only do we play all the great figures, uh, the leading figures like yourself of the, of the contemporary music world. Um, and I see lots of my friends on the stream there, but we really have come to specialize in, in discovering like you do at ACO, new generations uh, of emerging American composers. And that's been the most satisfying work we do up here. Well, I, I want to get back to you on the question of 10 weeks of rehearsal for a piece, because I know that that is something very special oh, about days, working yeah. with the youth orchestra. But, you know, I want to ask a man um, at the Chicago Sinfonietta, can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Because you, you also had an interesting journey into conducting itself uh, with Ben Zander and, and folks like that. And, and your, uh, you know, you had a, a quite a unique, you know, starting off, you played multiple instruments. And uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you got really intrigued by, you got the new music bug. The Chicago Sinfonietta now does, you know, really with a specialty in, uh, in so many composers, women composers, composers of color, there, it's, it's, it's really, uh, re really invigorated the scene, I think, in Chicago. So can you, can you talk us through that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, I probably owe uh, the beginning of my conducting experience to the composers at New England Conservatory. I mean, that was one of the ways I realized I could get podium time is that I could help the composers put together pieces regardless of how, how good the pieces were. You know, I, I just thought that was a chance to to benefit them, but also to benefit myself in terms of, you know, getting an instrument to conduct. I mean, that's the hardest thing, I think, for any young conductors. And so I have cultivated that relationships early on, even though it, it hasn't occurred to me that is a wonderful thing to champion, you know, like David's story. I wish I was in the midst of all these great minds and, and, and uh, amazing minds. And I was probably with a lot of wonderful classmates, but I was rather shy. And so it was, the new music was sort of a bridge to open up this whole world about conducting for me, because I literally, you have to be a personnel manager, a librarian and working with the composer, trying to get what the composer had in their head. I think that that to me is still one of the hardest thing is to get in the head of the creator because I view my role as an interpreter and I would never want to get in the way of the composers creating um, because I do want to give them that freedom to run with. And so um, after, af after I've gotten my, my start in conducting, um, the new music never felt far away. My subscription with Atlanta Symphony, actually the composers right here joining us, Shi Wang, um, who now lives in Dallas uh, Symphony, uh, 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 Dallas area, uh, was I think recommended to Atlanta Symphony through um, American Composers uh, Forum, probably through Evans Mirages, which is a, a wonderful my uh, as well. And so 
it, it's, it's wonderful to continue to champion for um, composers whose voice is not usually heard. And that just became uh, front and center when I took over Chicago Sinfonietta. You know, I, you probably remember uh, 2006 front page of New York Times. And I remember being a young conductor myself thinking, what is this crazy group that commissioned a concertino for cell phone orchestra? And that was before cell phone was a household item. And not, no, not knowing years later, I would actually be heading this crazy, wonderfully crazy orchestra in championing for composers of color, uh, particularly um, since, you know, the women's movement, the Me Too movement, uh, really help us to really focus on championing for women composers, which has occupied less than 2% um, in recent seasons. And now the orchestra as an industry has really taken up, you know, the cue of really championing for more. I, I wanted to show if it's okay, uh, because I, I also, uh, may I share the screen? Uh, You're welcome I, to share the screen as long as as long as they set you up to do that. Uh, uh, are are you set up now to share? Yes. Well, first of all, I, I think before we go too much into the the chart, I want to show you. I think we need to uh, congratulate our wonderful colleague here, David Allen Miller, and the Albany Symphony for the amazing Grammy win. And let me show you another. Um, uh, I I I just had it. Um, but I'm I, oh, sorry, I, I, I had to restart my screen, but uh, I wanted to show, this is incredible championing for this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I think that's pretty amazing achievement uh, for any conductor championing for new music and getting recognized for it. And so David Allen Miller, sorry that if I embarrass you, I just wanted to share that because as I was trying to Google uh, for materials to share, I just thought that is really cool in terms of new music and really being the forefront of it. And so another fun chart, if you allow me to share this uh, incredible work by the, uh, sorry, my computer is a little slow, Institute for Composers Diversity. And I'm scrolling down hopefully in a speed that's okay for everybody. So this is from 1920 and let me blow out this chart. It's really small to see, but I wanna talk about the first two tied at 32% River Oaks Chamber Orchestra uh, with which I serve as the artistic partner and Albany Symphony, they tie at 32% of the programming uh, championing for women uh, in their 1920 season. The Chicago Sinfonietta, we were uh, the second place, uh, five out of 19 works. The year before, well, actually the 1718 season, that was before the women composers became a trend. We were at 43% with our Project W. I'll talk about that in, in a second. Let me, let me show you another chart. And um, I don't know if you know that, David Alameda, uh, in terms of this chart, I, that's uh, that's incredible for Albany Symphony to really lead the country. So this is Chicago Sinfonietta, uh, uh, and this is for repertoire representing mu uh, musicians of color. And I just wanted to show you that 58%. That's that's pretty remarkable in terms of the Chicago Sinfonietta in, in our th three decades has consistently championing for musicians that's un underrepresented in the standard repertoire. So anyway, I will, I will stop this for now and I, I'll let you respond to what I just said. Well, it's absolutely fabulous. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's great that we have the, uh, representing the top three on that first chart, we have you two who represent really because uh, you're of course, as I, as I didn't even mention uh, in my two sentence opening bio, you're also an artistic partner, the art main artistic partner at, at Broco. And so, um, so that's, that's another one of your uh, positions that you hold. So the fact that you're doing programming and David is doing this kind of programming is, uh, you know, just shows that we have two of the leading minds in this, uh, in this area. So that's pretty exciting. And thanks for doing PR for David, by the way. That was really nice. Yeah, I'm hiring you, man. You're great. I don't know that I've ever seen a conductor do PR for another conductor like that. So that, might, that might be a first as well. <laughs> Usually just violence. They just do violence. To each well, other. you know, I, I just, 
I was just so amazed by how much David has done over the decades. And so it, it's just, it's so much that I, had, I, I have to actually bookmark them because if I have all the windows open, it will crash my computer <laughs> for the <laughs> session. So no, David, I just so admire how, I, I mean, how do you, if it's okay for me to ask this question, Derek, um, uh, how how do you find the support around championing for new music? You seem to have found, you know, such a great support and great team to support you to champion for that, which is, I think, you know, a lot of orchestras would love to have that. Well, as, as Derek sort of began to mention, I mean, uh, the Albany Symphony had a whole history of championing the music of our time before I got here. You know, I've been here almost, this is my 30th year next year. Um, but even before that, in the 1970s, this wonderful, crazy board chair who was at Albany for many, many years and now owns and runs Albany Music, the record company, Peter Cremani, um, he saw all these smaller and mid-sized orchestras having terrible financial trouble and trying to figure out how to be rele relevant, re relevant and, and trying to figure out how to serve their community. And being a fanatical new music lover, he just declared... If we go out of business, we're gonna go out of business playing new music. And he started just playing all of his favorite composers. And so when I, when the job was open and I applied, the Albany Symphony already had this great reputation as a bastion of, of living music. It happened that a lot of the music that Peter had the orchestra play, I'm not sure was such top drawer music. So there were a few years there at the beginning where I really had to kind of build trust with the audience. And we can talk about that because of course, you know I mean, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, as, as man knows so well, we performers, we uh, uh, conductors who run orchestras, we always have to be at least somewhat aware of marketing. Can we convince our audience to come to this concert? Will people want to come to this concert? Will people have a good time at this concert? So not that, um, you know, we only play likable pieces or pieces that we think will be populist, um, but we always kind of have in the back of our heads as any good performer interpreter from Mozart and before to the present always has, you know, how will this music go over? So there was a period during which I sort of began to do more of the repertoire that I love, uh, you know, of people like Michael Torkey and Derek and Joan Tower and various composers like that, John Harbison and John Corleano. But really we've, we've broadened that to really be about all sorts of new voices. And with new voices, part of the excitement is, is hearing a lot of different styles and views. So, so I've been very lucky in Albany in that Albany already had a tradition of kind of innovation and of not being afraid of living music. In fact, now I would say it's the opposite. If I ever do a concert where there isn't a new work, the audience is kind of upset and they say, well, where's the new piece? We didn't get to meet a new composer. And so it's, we've really flipped the whole thing on its head. And I think that we're, we're certainly not the only ones and you, Mayan, and your orchestras and many of my colleagues have really managed to do that. I think it's a very exciting time. I hope the composers on the chat all agree that you know, things are really opening up. And I think in a strange way, the pandemic has allowed us all to do even an additional reset of you know, what do we wanna be going forward? Uh, embracing diversity, embracing composers who happen to be women, embracing more equity across the field. I think it's a very exciting time for living music because uh, let's face it, most of the famous classical composers are dead white European males. So it's not surprising that those charts are so severe when you look at them because that's most of the repertoire that our orchestras have been playing. And this may be an opportunity for us to really reset. And I love, I love how you're talking about uh, taking people out of their comfort zone and bringing them a new comfort zone. So uh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, how do you choose programs, David? I mean, you uh, talk through some of the most interesting programs you've done recently, and that could be with the Albany Symphony, but it could be with the Dogs of Desire, your new music ensemble that's kind of rough and ready, and, or it could be uh, you know, programs that you've taken as a guest conductor elsewhere. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm a little afraid to be get too much into, into specifics, but I, I love what Mayen said, this idea of with living composers, you know, you really get to interact with them and talk to them. And if you're commissioning a piece, you can even ask, you may not be, be <laughs> they may not follow your direction. You can ask for a piece about a specific thing. So for example, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, I, I'm very passionate about history and particularly regional history. So we've done these wonderful summer festivals linked to our American Music Festival. Maybe the most celebrated of was in 2017, the summer we did something called Water Music, uh, uh, Water Music New York, Water Music NY. And we commissioned seven uh, brilliant emerging composers, each to partner with a different community along 
the Erie Canal, which stretches, as you probably know, from Albany to Buffalo, 330 miles, and sort of bisects the entire state of New York. And we, we basically put these seven composers, each of them in a different community along the canal, and uh, they spent three months living and working in that community and collaborating with a performing group in the community. And then we created these half hour long pieces and the orchestra and I floated, <laughs> we, we bust, but then we, we actually played some of the concerts on barges and in the canal. It was the, the 200th anniversary of the bicentennial of the, of the canal, 2017 was the kickoff. And we played these seven incredible world premieres, each one in and for on the waterfront, the community in which it was conceived and collaborating with a performing arts group in that community, choruses and dance companies and children's theater and various things, uh, folk, folk uh, culture workshops. And so um, we had these incredible pieces and we played on every, every night we would arrive at it. If it was a week, the uh, 4th of July week, every night we'd arrive in a different community and we'd have a quick rehearsal in the afternoon uh, with the performing collaborating group and with the composer and with the orchestra. And then we played this magnificent piece. And at the beginning we played Haydn Handel's water music. And afterwards we did like pops stuff and fireworks. And it was just this huge, fabulous cultural happening, but it was really around the idea of composers of today creating site specific art. Uh, and that was very powerful. So that kind of thing I love to do. And then the other, I won't get into detail, but the other kind of thing I love to do is I, I very often asked a composer, Joan Tower and George Sintakis are two who come to mind. And I remember Chris Rouse did an amazing one for us. I kind of called it informally inside the composer's brain. I would have the composer kind of co-curate the piece about his or her influences. And we played a big piece in the middle that was you know, their piece. So with Chris Rouse, the first one of those we did, we did his great violin concerto. And he had us play uh, Von Williams, the Fantasia, because he a big Von Williams guy. He had us play the Roman Carnival Overture. He's a big Berlioz guy. And we finished with the Strauss Rosen Cavalier Suite because that was the first piece of classical music he ever fell in love with. And hearing his piece surrounded by those other pieces, it's sort of the, con the contextualization of it was so powerful. And so I love doing concerts like that, where you really place a, a great new work in some kind of context. Well, it's really nice to hear how you're centering the composer in those discussions and... Uh, and um, composer is at the center. Don't you know that, Derek? Always. Well, you know, you don't always feel like that as a composer in the music world because you feel like uh, a little peripheral sometimes when, I mean, of course you know that the music was all written by composers, but sometimes, especially as an American composer, you don't really feel at the center of things um, uh, for un understandably, as you were talking about that most of the repertoire is by long dead white males from Europe, you know, so, so uh, even living white males from America feel a little bit estranged from that. But, you know, but I think that, um, you know, another thing that you touched on David is the, um, is the fact that, th that, that so much of what you do is informed by things that you really want your audience to connect with and the, the community to connect with in extra musical ways. And um, man, you've done a lot of programming in this way, really focused, I mean, especially with Chicago Sinfonietta, that's very focused on the community in which, uh, in which you are. And so uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that and then also about how that differs maybe from the programming that you might do with Roko or programming that you might do in uh, Taiwan, you know, with different orchestras or other places around the world where you've been? Yeah, sure, Derek, you know, um, part of my uh, also love for new music comes from being a young conductor and, you know, after I won the Malco competition in Denmark, doors were open like I never envisioned before. And so um, oftentimes I was approached um, to con get to conduct a certain program. And I don't know why they probably heard about I never said no, <laughs> so, so it was one premiere after another. And uh, I'll share a fun story of my first uh, Swedish um, experience. I think one of your questions is about the differences of audiences in, in various continents. I have a, a fun story later for you. But now let me talk about sort of, you know, uh, I love what David talked about site specific. I mean, we did try to have Chiscape sort of inspired by Jennifer Higdon's project with Atlanta Symphony, um, the, the, um, the, the cityscape idea. And so we have four composers. Uh, let, me, let me show you, um, uh, not this one. Um, can I share the screen again? 
uh, let me let me see if I can do this. Sure, of course. Um, no, not that one. Sorry. Um, let, let me share the right one. A little small screen here. Okay, so we had four young composers: Armando Bayolo, Vivian Fong, from originally from Canada, Jonathan Bailey Holland, and Chris Rogerson. Both uh, we the Ar Chicago Architecture Foundation actually provided twenty some buildings. You know the Chicago boat tour, ar architectural boat tour is very uh, famous pre-pandemic in terms of that's a must do as a tourist. And so they both, uh, th they each took up a building uh, that they feel so in inclined to and then wrote something um, to, to consist of this chai scape for us. But we also, I think the biggest, um, I don't know if I can jump to this. Can you see Project W on your screen? Okay, yeah. this is, uh, actually, I couldn't take the whole credit. Um, the musicians, the board, our volunteers, we all came together and said, what should we do for our 30th anniversary in honor of Maestro Paul Freeman who founded Sinfoniata in 1987 as the most diverse orchestra at that time in North America. And so the, the program that he handed the baton to me was a program featuring women composers. So we took that as a hint. And so we, uh, we featured, uh, I'm gonna scroll slowly, hopefully for you, Clarice Assad. I've been a fan of the Assad brothers and Clarice actually studied in Chicago and now returned to Chicago. So we thought that would be a really fun thing to commission her. Rina Esmel, I have to thank uh, Alicia, lawyer at Rocco for introducing Rina to me and I'll talk about Rocco in a second. Uh, so Rina actually wrote for us a brand new work and changed the, the title in the middle of it because the Me Too movement was just uh, so resonating with her. And so we, we have her change the title to Me Too. Uh, you will actually hear her sing the raga that, came, that became the piece. Her, her singing the raga was sort of a high point for me on this recording. Jennifer Higdon, a dear friend, I got to know from Atlanta Symphony. I assisted her singing room uh, for Jennifer Co. and the Atlanta Symphony and Chorus. And so I said to Jennifer, after I conducted her dance car in Houston um, with Rocco, I said, Jennifer, could we, could we sign on as a co-commission? And, you know, Jennifer told me that was the piece flying off her shelf during the pandemic. Uh, because everybody wants to do something. It was written for string. There are five movements. You can create a set of whatever movement you choose to for whatever length you want to. And so uh, there's also Jesse Montgomery. I should show you. There's Jesse Montgomery. Um, uh, let me see if I, that's Rocco. Give me a second. I have to, sorry, let me stop the sharing here so I can manage. Um, so Project W, let me, let me share this. Give me a second, sorry for my, for my small screen. Um, this is the actual Project W we did with uh, SETI Records who has recorded Sinfoniata over the years. The African-American Heritage Series are sort of my Bible to go to when I was a young conductor working with Atlanta Symphony, Baltimore Symphony, which has both a large African-American community. Um, so we, we championed these five. Florence Price, the first African-American woman uh, whose work being premiered by a major symphony when Chicago Symphony premiered her symphony in 1933. Then Rena, then Jennifer uh, Higdon and Clarice Assa and Jesse Montgomery uh, coincident, uh, coincident dances really just combining all her wonderful um, exposure to the various musical styles living in New York. And, uh, you know, so many orchestras are performing her um, a starburst for string. Uh, I was going to actually make that uh, in my Helsinki Philharmonic debut um, just a few days ago, but unfortunately got postponed uh, to later due to COVID. And so uh, the, the Project W has really been fun in terms of championing for women. Uh, but I, let me talk about another, um, another wonderful way of, of getting to know 
um, new works because sometimes it come to me as, as recommendation. And so here, let me show you the fun, um, the fun Roco re recording, which has your work in there, Derek. And so this is Vision Takes uh, Visions Take Flight with Roco, and that's Alicia, lawyer in the red high heels. And here are the composers, Karim Azam, Rina Esmail, Tim Morty for String Orchestra, Derek Vermel, and your, I have to say your uh, murmurations, the gliding over Algiers, that is just beyond sublime. I mean, the, the orchestra just love that so much. Anthony De Lorenzo, Marcus uh, Maroni, Concerto for Chamber Orchestras. And these pieces were chosen because they were the favorite of the Rocco musicians and all pieces commissioned by Rocco. So I, I wanna say, you know, kudos to uh, Alicia Lawyer and Rocco for ha having commissioned over a hundred new works uh, in their short 16 years of, uh, uh, of seasons. And so for, for any new composers out there, Alicia, sorry, I'm doing this to you. Hey, send your uh, pieces to Rocco and you may get, you may get programmed. Well, and, and Rocco is an interesting model because, uh, because it's run by its musicians, its founder, Alicia is a musician uh, in the orchestra. And, um, and there are a number of, of places like that, which are actually not conductor run, um, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra being one, uh, Q Young Kim, um, Orpheus being another. And, and, and I mean, there are a number of orchestras around the country even, uh, well, I mean, I could go on, but, but I think it's an interesting model to consider for orchestras that are, that are not necessarily run by a music director, um, um, notwithstanding, I mean, because not terrible. everybody is how, like- How do they do that? It must be terrible. Oh my God. I mean, not everyone is like you two who, who is so energized. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So what else, Derek, do people, I gather we have mainly composers on the, on the call. Yeah. Well, what you else? know, one thing that people have written in is that they're wondering about, about what happens with uh, programming because for example, you see some of the same names coming up uh, because David, you and, and me and you have programmed it, and a lot of orchestras have programmed some of these composers on the list. And so the question is, you know, what, what about, how do you find out about composers nobody else knows about and maybe composers who, who aren't as much in the spotlight and, um, and, and how do you come upon those programs and, and where do you, where have you found, found spaces for, for folks who, who might really just fit your particular interest or, or your particular taste? Um, David, have you, have you, can you think of someone like that or or you don't have to say any names but, well, there's this uh, one guy. but about your programming about the way you do programming yeah, there's this one guy who whenever i need a specific kind of composer i'll be like i need you know latin x uh, the composers born between 19 uh, 2003 and 2004 from guatemala who, and, and he always gives me like a list of like 35 composers and that person of course is you derek Vermel. Because you, of course, I don't want to shift the blame to you and have everybody only contact you, but you're at the epicenter of all this stuff. And it's amazing to me how every year, whenever I ask for any kind of a list, you always have a lot of new people. And so I would almost throw that back at you. But I would say, you know, you are the, the you're the gold standard of the people I'm always in touch with. And having now done this for many years, and I'm sure Mayan has the same kind of thing, there are just a great number of people I go to for, for guidance, really just not even to tell me who exactly I should be com co uh, commissioning, but to sort of tell me, you know, who they think is interesting, which of their students have emerged. Uh, I actually had this funny experience with Aaron Kernis at my last time trawling for composers. I wrote to Aaron as an old friend of mine you know, who teaches at, at Yale, and he sent me a whole list of composers. And I said, none of these are, are, your, are your students at Yale. He said, oh yeah, no, we just were going through, you know, candidates and these people looked really good. And I was like, well, why wouldn't you send me your students? He said, well, I thought maybe you knew my students. And so it's kind of, but I mean, uh, I have this whole- After all that Yale tuition? Yeah, I know. But he eventually, I, I insisted that he send me a bunch and he has wonderful students as, as does Chris Theofanidis at, at Yale and all the Yale teachers. Um, there are a lot of schools uh, where different, you know, composers of my generation or your generation or even the older generation, you know, teach. And I just know they have wonderful students and they're, you know, they're the obvious schools like USC and, and Michigan, you're wonderful. 
uh, and, or uh, alma mater in, in Yale and Princeton and uh, you know places like Juilliard and Curtis, et cetera, et cetera, Peabody. Um, so I, I kind of trawl a very large, as large a uh, world as I can, and then I'm always in touch with you know all the other people in the industry, fellow conductors and artistic administrators, and so I'm able to kind of access a really broad network. But it is true that it's very hard for someone who's maybe not inside that network to break in. So so you know in the olden days you would just send your material. But I do think it's really important, especially if there are young, young composers out there listening who, who want to know like how to, how to access these networks. Um, you really have to just be very friendly. <laughs> you have to meet a lot of people and you have to go to concerts and you have to introduce yourself and you have to apply to different programs and you have to go to workshops and you have to really try to have people know who you are and what you do. And then hopefully they'll help spread the word um, for you or with you. So it's, it's very imperfect science, but you know, my feeling is if you trawl widely enough, and actually the people who are most useful to me now are all of these wonderful young composers we have commissioned. So, you know, I mean, for example, there's this wonderful Australian, not to name names, but I'll give you as, as an example, Jack Freer is a wonderful Australian American composer who went to Juilliard, and I guess now is at Yale. And he's a wonderful composer, we've commissioned him, but he's given me all sorts of wonderful names. He mentioned Tyson Davis to me, who's just, just starting out pretty much at Juilliard and we commissioned him. And so I, I actually talked talk to a lot of the emerging composers to tell me who their friends are and who they've heard. And, and that really broadens it a great deal as well. Yeah, and man, that, I, I mean, David, I love how you describe uh, your reaching out to a lot of people in the field. Uh, you know, man, how, how do we get beyond just academia for suggestions uh, or, you know, just other other people who are also composers or conductors in the field um, to expand, you know, the possibilities of of symphonic music and concert music? I mean, how do we how do we also draw on um, on, on other genres of music and, and, and other potential? I mean, this is a tricky question because writing for orchestra is a hard thing and not everybody can just, you can't just kind of decide one day, okay, I'm going to write an orchestra piece. I mean, you need a lot of training or else you have to work with an orchestrator. But um, have you, you've been addressing this question sometimes as well, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to follow up on David's recommendation, I think I can't stress how important word of mouth is in terms of, you know, networking, because, you know, for example, one of our um, one of our composer in residence this year is Catherine Bostick, uh, who became the first African-American woman admitted to the Hollywood Academy of Motion Pictures. And, and so she came to me uh, through one of our musicians who have heard her August, uh, August Wilson Symphony um footage with pittsburgh symphony and so I, I i think i think i could say this maybe same with uh david we conductors we have a lot of curiosities i mean i'm daily i'm checking out composers that i don't know and and i i've i've i would habitually google other orchestras just to see what what people what, what names pop up that i don't know and so i will highly recommend all the composers out there whether you have started writing for orchestra it really doesn't matter to me because i i go from just listening to a whole bunch of things when i encounter a new name i don't just look for does this person has an orchestra music I, I want to go from, I want to understand this person and what's unique about this person. So I just, I just listened to what I could find. And so I want to say, you know, uh, of this digital age, the website is so important. We just did a website session for all our fellows, instrumental, conducting, because I think that's how people are serving and find your information. And at the same time, if you could also have any bridge. Um, I don't know if there's still Kofel score. I remember uh, when I was music director with uh, Memphis Symphony, we did a Kofel score um, partnership with American Composers Forum. And we have decided that it's going to be you, um, uh, 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 no names, meaning we'll just receive the scores. And we, I actually play the recordings or MIDI file uh, with the circle of friends. We have a, 
a main circle of friends is uh, everybody uh, contribute a thousand dollars to be in this friend circle and most of them are not musicians and they didn't come to symphony because they love Beethoven it was more of a social um, gathering and so we literally played the the the, the, the MIDI file and uh, only I could read the score without knowing any names of the composers and so there was one there was one piece that didn't make the cut because it has to be connected to Dr. King's a speech for the, the dream project. The one score stood out. I didn't know the com who the composer was. I saved the score because it was so interesting. And lo and behold, and this was, uh, I wanted to say 2013. And, you know, I, I had to move all my score to Chicago and I kept that score. I didn't know who the composer was. I kept that score and lo and behold, about three years later when Alicia Rocco um, invited me to do this uh, debut album with them, it was Karim Azam's uh, Visions from Another World. I mean, that's just, when the piece is good, you have to be patient. If you have the patient, it's going to get played somehow. You just have to have faith. And, you know, I have actually known that work much longer than, than probably um, given the actual score, pretty score from Rocco. But I, I think it's important for young composers to know, um, and, and I should say this, I've been bombarded with, um, with composers, um, messengers and all that. I'm not sure that's the most effective way because I think when there's not, when we get too many, we ended up just not able to see everything. So I will say, you know, treat this relationship also like with common sense. Start with your uh, webpage, but also find, start to build networks with friends that, you know, it's amazing how many uh, classmates I run into, Derek, you and I at U of M, but, but also every orchestra I walk into, there's someone that I went to school with. So start building your network that way and maybe start with small. Like if someone really believes in your work, cultivate that, write for that person and have that person start to champion your work. And it, it, if you have enough patience and keep working at it, I will say bake bread in every oven. <laughs> right. And I would say, man, that's perfect. I, I just to uh, follow on that, I, I've been so impressed in the last 10 or 15 years at the incredible blossoming of all these uh, composer collectives. I mean, it happens particularly in New York and Brooklyn. And, but I know that, um, you know, people who are done with school or out of school who didn't go to school, you know, are, are, are banding together. The, the pandemic put a little wrinkle in it, but I hope it's all going to flourish again. And I think it, it did virtually during the pandemic as well. But there's so many wonderful groups of young composers who aren't waiting. You know, it's very much like the model that caused Bang on a Can to come into existence. When you hear David and, and Michael and Julie talk about it, you know, they say, well, we just decided we couldn't sit around waiting for the New York Philharmonic to discover us. So we created our own festival. And I think young composers today are really taking that idea to heart. And, and it's true that the more you create and the more you share with other creators, and there's this wonderful collaborative feeling between composers that's not so competitive anymore, I think. And that's so healthy. So I think the more different kinds of networks, as she says, bake bread in as many ovens as you can, the better. And then you know, you'll always be successful, I think, if you're, if you're diversified enough. May I share one of my favorite projects that I have seen you do, David? May I share this? The Sleeping sure. Giant Collective. I mean, that's pretty mind-boggling because I think I always think of composers. Sorry, let me scroll it slowly. I always think of composers as individual mind and they only care about his or her own work. But when I saw this, it was like, wow, how did they do it? And so I, I don't know if I blow it big enough you know, for everybody to see. Do you want to talk about that at all, David? Just, just briefly, this was a group of guys who met each other at, at Yale. Sadly, they're all white males <laughs> of a similar, I guess, socioeconomic bracket. These days, they could never have succeeded. But back then, whenever that was, eight years ago, uh, they when they finished school, they all moved to Brooklyn and became this cooperative called Sleeping Giant. And I had played, you know, a lot of Ted Hearn's music and um, and so and and uh, so we developed a three-year residency that uh, that uh, was uh, just a wonderful thing that uh, meet the, meet the composer at the time I guess it was called <laughs> funded um, and they did these amazing amazing um, 
three years of programming with us individually and together. And it was, and we did a whole reimagining of the Mozart Requiem where each of them re, uh, each of them orchestrated a different movement from the Mozart Requiem. And uh, we just did amazing programs with them. It was quite extraordinary. And, you know, they're all becoming rather celebrated composers, not just Andrew Norman and Timo and Ted and Robert and Jacob. I mean, they're all, Chris, they're all fantastic. Well, there's, uh, yeah, I think you, you've you both been quite creative uh, with, um, with, with all these different kinds of projects that you do. Um, you know, there were some questions about, uh, you know, there, it's interesting because, because the, the question about identity comes up a lot and there's a question about identity from both sides about, uh, about, about how to kind of balance things um, and, and how you, how you find composers and what do you value in music? And, uh, I mean, it's, we probably don't have enough time to get into all these things, but I'm, you know, I'm not so sure that it's an either or proposition. I don't want to answer this for you, but I think that there's, there's really space for everything. Uh, and, and, and I, of course you as conductors have to be thinking about so many different things about audience, about, um, you know, about, about, of course, about the music that you might love, but also just about, you have, you have so many aspects, the musicians who are playing, you have to think about the board, you have to think about where you stand in a kind of historical sense in the, um, you know, in the orchestra world. And do you think that, that you can and are having an effect on a, on a larger, on larger issues in the orchestra world? And what do you think, so, you know, there was a question about what's the best way to have an effect on on the on the larger kind of orchestra world if you feel that there needs to be more representation uh if you feel that perhaps maybe there's becoming too much representation of young composers as opposed to older composers who as they said may not have pr agents or may not have connections to academia um what do you think about those questions let me just say before I say anything, I'm, I was dating myself. It's New Music USA. I was sort of grasping for Meet the Composer. I, I don't even remember if it was still called, uh, um, but it, it's what is New Music USA that gave us the amazing funding for that, um, for that Sleeping Giant residency. So God bless them. They're such a great institution. Um, I, I just want to answer that briefly by saying, now that I've been doing this for a few decades, a number of decades, um, I really believe in, pra in, in practice. And by practice, I mean the Buddhist uh, meaning of practice, not like sitting at the piano doing scales that you, 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 you don't, you know, you can preach and preaching is fine and we should all, um, you know, stand by what we believe. But in my experience, you do what you believe is right and you keep doing it. And then eventually, you know, maybe history will catch up with you. Um, and, and if you don't do it, if you just talk and don't do, then you're not going to have any impact. But I, one of the things I feel most wonder, most proud about in Albany, is, and it's not just me, it's the Albany Symphony and the culture of the place and the musicians and the board and the leadership and all that, and, and the community and the public, um, you know, we just love living composers and love our American composers and love to discover new composers and hear new voices. And, um, and so we just practice that. And what I've been so delighted in in the last few years, especially apropos of what Mayen was just talking about, about more representation of composers who are women and composers who are people of color, is that while yes, obviously it's become a really central issue as it should have become 50 or 100 or 200 years ago. And maybe there's a little bit of, you know, going over extremely strongly in that direction. So suddenly all the white male middle-aged composers are a little neglected, but, um, but that's a that's an understandable corrective. But to me, to me, um, just believing in what you do and doing it as passionately as you can, and you know, we're all in the business of trying to bring great music into the world, or trying to bring great, great spiritual musical activities to 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 the world. And as long as you're doing that, it's powerful. I, I've always been we were having that discussion earlier about about you know, why uh, you were saying, Derek, you know, a lot of composers feel, living composers feel peripheral, like you barely get on the program and you barely get rehearsed and you barely get this and you barely get that. To me, that is a, a, a recent, I mean, looking historically, that's a recent phenomenon. I mean, in Mozart's time, who would ever have thought of playing a piece by a dead composer? I mean, that was just a weird out, a weird ass idea. And that continued really through the beginning of the 20th century that, you know, dead composers were considered kind of a novelty for much of the time. And it's only in this century, and obviously there are lots of market forces and things like that that have caused the absolute flip where now the living composer is the, the peripheral one. But my whole agenda and Albany's whole agenda has really been to 
flip that back to where it should be. Exactly, just like I was talking about, you know, build a concert around Joan Tower. You know, Joan Tower shouldn't be the opener for a concert about Berlioz. It should be, you know, Berlioz shines light on Joan Tower. So I think it's about practice. That's wonderful. I mean, and 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 I mean, Yan, you can answer to that. But I, I, I was also curious just to tell us about um, interesting Taiwanese composers and 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 what you've been doing. Obviously, you have that beautiful hall behind you, as we remarked on at the beginning. And and you know, what are some of the things that you might be doing there, or or plans that you have over there uh, as well? Well, actually, if, if I may, I, I I've championed. Um, Taiwanese composers, especially when I get conduct in Taiwan, but um, but I have actually the Taiwanese orchestra really interested in me bringing American composers uh, because you know they have plenty of other conductors uh, in Taiwan that could champion for the Taiwanese um, uh, representation. And so I, I like to just mention, you know, and and I have your season queue up as well, David. So if you want to talk about that as well, I think we're running out of time. Um, I I, uh, I I wanted to uh, bring everybody's awareness of something that I pushed forward during this pandemic because we almost lost our um, we almost lost our commissions and and so the, the so talking about uh, what David was just talking about actually we built our MLK annual MLK concert around this new commission. It was by Joel Thompson, who wrote the seven last words of the unarmed. And when we performed that two years ago uh, during our MLK concert, I was shocked to find out we were only the third performance um, since it was already written, uh, I think back in 2015 or 16. And so I approached uh, Joel and said, our audience love your piece. Could we create something that's close to your heart, uh, given what's happening. You know, there was a Black Lives Movement happening, and I do. We had a change of CEO, and our new CEO happened to be a childhood friend with Joel Thompson, and so one thing led to another. So he created this very powerful new piece, "Brief Burn and Elegy in Memory of Brianna Taylor." Uh, featuring cello and orchestra. And, you know, um, our young rising star, Epitayo Ali Lending, uh, a daughter of our longtime uh, founding member um, in the violin section, she's, she, I've done her a great favor. She's going to pitch this piece uh, when other orchestras approach her. And I'm going to pitch this piece to other orchestras I'm guest conducting. And so I think I think one of the uh, one of the issues um, I have I found so many pieces get played once, um, but I think this is a, a time and age where obviously commission commissioning fees are challenging, especially post a pandemic. If orchestras could come together and we perform some others, each other's work, I think that that would really help out some of the composers in terms of getting a second and a third performances. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I, one thing that uh, I actually discussed with Joel uh, about this piece, because ACO is, is, is performing at the Apollo Theater next year, uh, uh, Joel's uh, Seven Last Words. Uh, but, you know, one thing that we um, we discussed was that his, his work has choir and his work is written with triple winds. And that is makes it very difficult for orchestras to program and so i guess one one easy uh programming thing is is to so that some composers have multiple versions not only some of the dead white male european composers have multiple versions of their pieces because they knew that you know they might they might actually get the chance to to have them performed multiple times uh in different scenarios and so i think that's something composers can really think about just what you mentioned, and maybe this new piece of Joel will be even more adaptable uh, for other orchestras to be able to do. And I love that you're doing this during the pandemic. David, Do you? is there anything else you want to tell us about what you, because you, Albany's been doing quite a bit during the pandemic. Yeah, we've been just doing our regular subscription concerts. We just redesigned the season in, in August. And, you know, basically we're doing them all with the orchestra co-locating, but small orchestras. Oh, there's, <laughs> man, you're there's so your publicist. She's I not going to send you $10,000 tomorrow for all of this. That's amazing. <laughs> So there's our season. And, and what we did was, you know, we did a lot of uh, arrangements of, of wonderful, like we did a Mahler four that was just gorgeous. 
by an English guy named Farrington who has a whole bunch of, of transcriptions and Rachmaninoff third in this really compelling version for 25 musicians. But on every concert, as you'll see, I mean, the next one's coming up. We've got a world premiere by Tanner Porter and George Santakis. We were supposed to do the Requiem, a new work that we're doing next season. That So we subbed in his famous second violin concerto. We've got, as you see on the festival at the end, Nina Shakar and Clarice and Molly Joyce and Alexis Lamb. And we had some Jesse Montgomery on with Caroline Shaw. And, um, Michael Torkey with Viet Quang. And so we've got just great, great stuff. The whole season has been so much fun. It's been hard for our musicians, as you can imagine, because we're playing with, you know, between 15 and 30 musicians as opposed to between 50 and 80. Um, so it's a lot less revenue for our musicians, but we've managed to put on just beautiful concerts and every concert has been built around uh, a world premiere or a major recent new work. And we had uh, Tyson Davis's exciting new piece and Carlos Bandera just wrote a beautiful piece for us. And so lots of exciting stuff. So we're, we're keeping the spirit of it all going. We're playing all these concerts live in real time on the Saturday nights they were originally intended with a pre-concert talk with the composer and a, a talk back with the audience doing chat afterwards. So it's been really, it's been really great. Um, and we're just excited to be you know, next year we're going to be back in the concert hall, but we've already made a commitment. Our board has made the commitment to spend the many, many tens of thousands of dollars to be able to uh, present our programs virtually as well as live. So we're going to be doing both next year. So that's really exciting. Wow. Well, um, David and man, I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, just it's so great to hear and very inspiring, I think, for composers. Uh, but also for the rest of our audience. Uh, thank you, audience, for, uh, for, being, for being there for us and for, uh, for spending this hour with these two great minds. Uh, and um, and you, please look out for an email from us with a link to the recording of this webinar, and um, there'll be a post-webinar survey, which we may ask you to fill out, um, and you can check the chat, which should have the link. Um, so please take a few minutes to take that survey so that we can tailor our future programs to you. Um, join us for another webinar on April 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, it's going to be, I should say, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, since people are tuning in from all over the place, uh, for a panel about recording law and licensing. Uh, this one will have Chris Campbell, Director of Recordings at Innova, uh, the uh, lawyer, mu uh, the music lawyer Ari Solitoff, and producer Amiranai uh, Shim, who's going to uh, talk. To, they're all going to talk to about, about the process of making recordings, why they're important. I think you probably know why they're important, but and all the different things that you can do to make that process easier uh, for you as a composer or a performer in music or a conductor. Um, thanks so much to AC ACF staff, American Composers Forum staff, especially Billy Lackey. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Laura Kreider, who's here with us uh, on this production. Thank you to Damien Strange. Thank you to Vanessa Rose at the American Composers Forum. And thank you to all the staff at ACO, Aiden, uh, Melissa, Lindsay, Jade, all my colleagues, Kevin. They're doing great work. Um, and thank you so much, David and Mayan. Um, this panel will be recorded and it'll be available on ACO's YouTube and the American Composers Forum's website. Thank you both so much uh, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. And we'll look forward to hearing your programs uh, and seeing you back on stage. Thanks. Great to be with you. Great to see you, Mayan. Thank everybody. you for having me. Thank you. So great to see everyone.